Dobrze, szanowni państwo, chyba już jesteśmy gotowi. Ja miałbym tylko taką jeszcze prośbę, słuchajcie. Szanowni studenci, bardzo się cieszę, że jesteście z nami. To jest naprawdę świetny czas, ale jakbyście tak się też troszeczkę rozjeżdżyli dookoła i obok was stałby wasz profesor, a może nawet dziekan albo ktoś inny, to zróbcie takim starym, fajnym zwyczajem. Ja jeszcze jestem z tego dziwnego pokolenia, że w tramwaju miejsca ustępowałem. Także jakbyście, słuchajcie, tak się rozejrzeli, zobaczyli tam jakiegoś waszego profesora albo dziekana, to może byłoby potem łatwiej na zaliczeniu, co? Dobra. To jest ten moment, w którym się rozglądacie nerwowo. A potem dajecie tyle. Tak. Dobrze, proszę państwa, jeżeli już te kwestie organizacyjne mamy, mamy w miarę ogarnięte, to dobrym zwyczajem jest się przedstawić. Ja tutaj dzisiaj jestem najmniej ważny, nazywam się Krzysztof Szymański, jestem rzecznikiem prasowym Politechniki Warszawskiej, ale moją dzisiejszą rolą przede wszystkim jest oddać za moment głos naszemu znakomitemu gościowi. Widzicie zresztą państwo, dzisiaj nas czeka uczta. Będzie wykład pana profesora Stanleya Whittinghama. Są z nami znamienici goście, nie będziemy dzisiaj wszystkich witać. Za moment będziemy przechodzili już od razu do wykładu i oddam głos w tym momencie dziekanowi Wydziału Fizyki panu profesorowi Wojciechowi Wróblowi i życzę państwu wspaniałego czasu. Bardzo dziękuję. Dzień dobry państwu. Szanowni państwo, ja właściwie mam tutaj przygotowany pewien zestaw informacji, które chciałem przekazać, ale najpierw nie mogę się powstrzymać i nie powiedzieć, że jestem bardzo zadowolony i szczęśliwy z tak licznej frekwencji. To jest... Tak jak tu zostało powiedziane, mam nadzieję, że będziemy świadkami uczty. Laureat Nagrody Nobla, profesor Stanley Whittingham opowie nam o tym, jak on widzi znaczenie i rolę magazynowania energii w tym, co jest kluczowym problemem otaczającego nas świata, czyli ze zmianami klimatu. Jestem zaszczycony i... no. Przy takich okazjach zazwyczaj wypada wprowadzić w kilku słowach, opowiedzieć o, o prelegencie i to jest bardzo trudna rola, bo z jednej strony e, można by powiedzieć bardzo dużo, a z drugiej strony jak ja zacznę wymieniać wszystkie nagrody, to to trochę nie ma sensu. Ja spróbuję powiedzieć o kilku faktach, które moim zdaniem mają znaczenie. E, Profesor Whittingham studiował w Oksfordzie, a potem wiele kluczowych osiągnięć zrealizował we współpracy czy podczas pracy w laboratoriach firmy Exxon. Aktualnie jest zatrudniony na Uniwersytecie Sany w Binghamton. I, i tak naprawdę ta, ta część jego kariery jest bardzo dobrze znana, była nam osobom e, naukowcom z Wydziału Fizyki, z Wydziału Chemicznego Politechniki Warszawskiej, bo my wielokrotnie spotykaliśmy profesora na konferencjach, e, korzystaliśmy z jego osiągnięć naukowych, które opublikował w fantastycznych publikacjach. W związku z tym dla nas był znany od bardzo dawna, no a dla szerokiej publiczności stał się niewątpliwie bardzo znany wtedy, kiedy w 2019 pojawiło, pojawiła się informacja, że e, to został laureatem Nagrody Nobla w dziedzinie chemii razem z profesorem Johnem Goodinafem i e, profesorem Akiro Yoshino. E, no i, i ten obszar, za który zostali nagrodzeni, no to jest za obszar rozwoju baterii litowo-jonowych. To jest niezwykle ważny obszar. Wszyscy państwo wiecie, jak ważne w tej chwili, jak kluczową rolę właściwie zmieniającą naszą cywilizację spełniły i pełnią baterie litowo-jonowe. I, I to, że to jest takie ważne, zostało uhonorowane w dniu wczorajszym przez Politechnikę Warszawską nadaniem profesorowi Whittinghamowi honorowego doktoratu, doktoratu honoris causa. No i, i właściwie... Myślę, że całą resztę e, tego, tego dzisiejszego popołudnia przekażemy profesorowi Whittinghamowi. So, profesor Whittingham, we are very honored and very happy uh, that you visited us. Uh, 
and that you agreed to, to, to have an open lecture for so many young in age and young in mind uh, people who are so interested what to do, what can we do to, to change the, the climate problems and how the, the energy storage based on the lithium batteries can help us with this. So, Professor Whittingham, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Just waiting for the slides to change. There we go. So, many thanks for this invitation and thank you for this huge crowd here. Um, I promise I will finish well before your World Cup game starts. <laughs> and now that your main competition has suffered a severe loss, you're in a very good place to move forward. Um, what I really want to do is build on what really the um, Nobel Committee said. And they said the three of us had built the foundation of a fossil free society. And what we now have to do is work on that and make sure we, in fact, do that. So I don't think I need to say too much. You've all seen all these disasters around the world, basically all blamed on climate change. And this is clearly disrupting us all. So I show you examples in Germany, Florida, Chile, Colorado, this glacier disappearing in Banff, Canada, and there's latest floods in Valencia in Spain. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world, things are getting worse and worse all the time. And people ask me, you, know, you didn't come from a snowy part of the world, did you? Well, when I was a child, we got lots of snow in the middle of England. When I flew into London about 10 years ago, it snowed at Heathrow Airport and we were stuck there for an hour and a half. They didn't have any snow plows anymore. So things have changed dramatically in the sense of getting warmer. So in the last 20 years, we've had really through two major disruptions in our lives, and there's another one coming right now. Um, many of the younger folks play won't remember when there was a time when there were no laptop computers, no smartphones, no iWatches, and even no um, small computers that would do things. We all had to go to our old big house full of vacuum tubes and the computer. So we've had this communications revolution. So you're now instantly aware of what's happening all around the world. This wasn't the case when I was brought up. And clearly in the last three years, we've all been disrupted by COVID. And this has highlighted a few issues and a few, I would say, pluses. The biggest issues, we found out that global supply chains don't work. On the positive side, we've found how smart we are, or our colleagues are, in finding vaccines in you know, rapid pace. We could not have anticipated having the vaccine so quickly. But now we have to adapt to climate change. And I say adapt, I don't think we can necessarily roll it all the way back, but we can perhaps stop it getting worse. Climate change is much more difficult than the other two. We're kind of given our smartphones, our small computers. As Steve Jobs said, he, he knew what we wanted before we knew what we wanted. So when they came, we all bought them. Um, COVID, we had to face up to. Climate change is much more long-term, so it would be more difficult to handle. But we have to do with less fossil fuels. Particularly, we have to eliminate mostly coal in the initial stages. Um, we are very proud in New York State. We can now say we don't generate a single kilowatt hour of electricity from coal. We do use some other fossil fuels. Um, and in my particular town, we put in a small lithium battery system about 12 years ago. Within two months of that starting up, the coal power plant next to it was turned off and it never came back on again. So a smallish battery can replace a Pika coal power plant. But if we are to use clean energy sources, whether solar, wind, they are intermittent, so we've got to have storage. And lithium batteries are 
the most flexible means of that storage and not the largest form of that storage. The largest form of that storage by far is pumped hydro. And you have pumped hydro all the way around the world. In pumped hydro, you're talking about gigawatts of power for days or weeks at a time. The big change in pumped hydro is the turbine motors are now 73% efficient. So most pumped hydro systems are putting new modern turbines in place. The challenge is there are remarkably few new possible sites because most people don't want pumped hydro in their backyard. They don't want to see it. And I was surprised when I was in Galicia last week, they are installing two new pumped hydro systems away from a river so it doesn't mess up the river, but they can make money doing that. But as I said, batteries are by far the most common method. Um, they're portable, they can be stationary, they can go from tiny milliwatts that might be in a credit card to gigawatt hour facilities, and I'll show you that in a moment. And they're very fast switch on and off in a matter of seconds, whereas pumped hydro, you're talking several minutes. But first, I need to thank ESSO, and I think that's Play Exxon Mobil over here now as well. They had the foresight to initiate a number of clean energy ideas back in the 1970s. And we built our first lithium rechargeable battery in 1972 in October. So it's exactly 50 years old now. And you can see I was a bit younger in those days. But you'll see there we also use rather large single crystals. And I'll come back to why that's important in a minute. In the center is a copy of the original patent that was filed in 1973. And on the right hand side is two of the batteries that we built in those days. The top one is a paperweight we gave away to potential customers. You can see that has a clock in it, a little solar cell, and a battery. And that particular one is still on my desk and it's still working today. We think it was built about 1976. Beneath that are much larger batteries. These are about six inches by four inches by about an inch thick. And these were used for electric vehicles. That was SO's interest. No, no one had dreamed of smartphones and things like that back in the 70s. So they built these. These were the electric vehicle show in Chicago in 1977. So that's where we were back then. This is where we are now. And I tried to pick a selection of vehicles here. The small two-seater there is the electric vehicle from Italy. If you've ever been to Bermuda, you will know that you cannot drive a car there as a tourist. But when we went in 2019, they had just passed a law that you could drive an electric vehicle. So we were driving one of the first half dozen electric vehicles on the island. And we were told if you drive it to the other end of the island, make sure you recharge it before you bring it back. It doesn't have enough mileage in it. So we did exactly what we were told. We drove it to the other end of the island, took it to the charging station, and they were still building it. So, so fortunately, we found a small charging station at the hotel on the way back so we could get back to the hotel. The other two pictures at the top are what we call the big rig trucks and the garbage truck. And I got the chance of driving both those just north of Seattle in Washington State. That's um, PACOR research labs there, their test track. And those were totally electric and they're both available in the United States now for service. Below that are two all electric buses, a Mercedes bus and a BAE Systems bus. The BAE Systems bus is made in the Binghamton area. Um, there's a Raymond forklift truck there, also lithium battery powered, and that's also in the Binghamton area, then a BMW car beneath it. So that's transportation. Here's the situation now for grid storage. Right now in the United States, renewable energy costs less than a new coal power plant. And we can understand that. 
how important that is in the state of Texas, which is very much a Republican state, and I don't think they know what climate change means. 95% of all the new power systems they're putting on the grid are going to be renewable, wind or solar. So I show you an example there of, a, of the sun shining on this facility just south of San Francisco. This is 1.6 gigawatt hours. That's by factor of four the largest system in the world. They've got permission to expand that to around six gigawatt hours, so it's going to be huge. And even that cannot collect all the solar energy that's generated on a good sunny day around noontime. To the right of that is a small facility we had in Binghamton, which was eight megawatts. And that's the one that um, put the coal bit power plant out of business. It's another good example because about around 2014, 2015, the company found they could make more money in the state of Ohio, so they just brought a, up a truck and towed these away to Ohio. So that's why electric grids, like lithium batteries, they're very portable. You can move them from place to place as needed. And above that is a wind farm in West Virginia. Wind is very um, up and down, second to second, so you have to smooth the power. So that those are lithium batteries there, smoothing the power, and shifting it to the time when it's needed. The third application is on the International Space Station. Whilst we're in, in um, Sweden three years ago, two of the physicists and I talked to these two astronauts live, and the lady is from the state of Maine in the US. Her mother was from Sweden, hence the Swedish flag. And the fellow there is from Italy. And they'd just finished replacing all the uh, old nickel metal hydride batteries with lithium ion batteries on the International Space Station. And they're very happy because they're half the size, half the weight, and they're going to last twice as long. So before I get into any chemistry, and I promise there won't be too much, just enough for the, the students working in the battery area, but I want to give a little bit of the history here so you can see what really happened over those 50 years. So all the systems that you use today are all based on what we call intercalation chemistry, intercalation compounds, and this is where you have a guest-host reaction. So you have a host structure, and I show you here on the left-hand side on the round, that might be graphite. The lithium that ions then intercalate within those layers, and on the right-hand side, similarly on the other side. So these are intercalation reactions. The structure of the host does not change, except maybe for a 5 or 10% expansion. That's why these materials and batteries can be charged thousands of times, because you're not destroying the structure. But over these 50 years, we learned a number of things. One, lithium metal by itself is not the safest metal to use. Any of you who've done um, electro deposition will know that metals tend to deposit as dendrites. Those are sharp, spiky things, and they then short out the anode and the cathode. So at Exxon, we switched to a lithium aluminum alloy. And this works fine for 10 or 20 charges. What made the batteries, in the end, economically successful is the work of Akira Yoshino, where he showed that you can use graphitic carbons, as shown in the picture here, where you can store the lithium between those sheets. But it has a big penalty. You need 72 grams of carbon to store seven grams of lithium. The graphite also takes up half the volume of the cell. So if we are to make progress, we've eventually got to get rid of all that carbon. So there's a lot of work today working on Tin or silicon, both of those elements can react with over four lithiums. So they basically have the same volumetric energy density as lithium itself. But our long-term goal is to go back to pure lithium and make it safe. On the other electrode, the cathode, that's where the lithium ions go on discharge. We started out with this layer compound, lithium titanium disulfide. It's a nice soft material. It's a metallic conductor. So the Electrons can get in and out very easily, as well as the ions. Um, it has a lowish voltage. 
So when combined with the, combined with the graphite, the voltage was really too low to be totally successful. So John Godenough investigated lithium cobalt dioxide, which he was looking at as a magnetic material. He read our paper and said, this will work. He tried it and it did work. But any self-respecting chemist never tried it. We didn't try it. Our colleagues at Bell Labs didn't try it because we were all taught cobalt-4 doesn't exist. So there's no point even trying to pull the lithium out and make cobalt-4. So we learned don't always believe what the textbooks say. And really in this whole area of batteries, most of these materials are thermodynamically metastable at some point. So the lithium cobalt oxide is still what's in your um, smartphones. Cobalt is a big problem. It's very expensive. It comes from Congo. There's child labor involved, so there's a big push to get the cobalt out. So that's now being replaced by nickel and manganese. That's what we mean by NMC. Or in the case of Tesla, they use nickel, cobalt, and aluminum. So that's the workhorse of all the lithium ion batteries out in the world. John, about 20 years ago, also found out this lithium ion phosphate also enabled lithium ions to intercalate in and out in a reversible manner. But now you're carrying this heavy phosphate group, so the energy density is much worse. But this is a material that ought to be used for most grid storage because it's lower cost. So what we're doing is saying we want to use phosphates, they're safer, so let's put an element in there where we can now put two lithium ions or two sodium ions into the structure. So we've been looking at these van der Waals phosphates. A lot of people ask, well, no, you got the Nobel Prize, the fundamental science is finished, isn't it? Now let's get on and use them. But if you look at the numbers inside that red oval, that's the percentage of the theoretical energy density that is actually in a commercial lithium ion battery. So it ranges from about 11% to 25%. So there's still a huge opportunity to improve that energy density. And if you look at the far right hand side, that those are the same numbers, but now on a weight basis, about 25%. So we are part of what's called a Battery 500 Consortium. In the United States, there's about six national labs and six universities involved in it. And our goal is to get the um, energy density up to 500 watt hours per kilogram. And I won't go into all the details, but just show you that we are achieving that step by step. So this program is now five years old. And I think you can see that in 2017, we had 50 cycles at 300 watt hours per kilogram compared with the commercial of about 250. A year later, we're up to 250. The following year, we increased now the energy density to 350. And as of um, this summer, we've got about 800 cycles at 350. So we're showing you can do this. And these cells are using pure lithium metal. And they're now using ether-based electrolytes, not the common carbonate ones that have been used before. I also want to point out the morphology of the particles we use in these batteries is what we call meatballs. So they're comprised of primary particles, 100 to 200 nanometers, and these secondary particles are about 10 microns across. And if I mention numbers like 622811, that's just referring to the ratio of the nickel to the manganese to the cobalt. But as I said, we want to um, eliminate as much of the cobalt as we can. We also want to increase the energy density of these cells as far as we can. And the figure on the right shows you the discharge capacity we can get as a function of the nickel content. So the higher the nickel content, the more the energy density you can get. But if you look at the vertical axis now, we show you the thermal stability there. That's the temperature at which these materials, after you take out most of the lithium, will release oxygen. So I said they're metastable. These transition metals don't want to be four plus, so they'll tend to release oxygen. 
So our challenge is really to use as much nickel as we can, stabilize these materials so they don't release the oxygen and get into that blue circle at the top there, which is 100% capacity retention, no loss of oxygen and long life. And on the bottom left-hand side, I show similar data, different charging potentials, number of other different parameters, but the same thing, that straight line is directly related to the nickel content, so it's totally nickel content that determines stability. So what can we do to um, stabilize these materials? Well, the first thing you do is decrease the surface area. The less surface you've got, the less react reactions that can occur. So the, the push then is say, let's go back to the single crystals that we used to have at SO. The second method is to modify the materials so they're not so reactive. So we can do surface treatments there. And also there's a second issue these materials all lose 10 to 20% of their capacity on the very first cycle, so we have to reduce that loss. To um, modify the materials so they cycle for a long time, we want to bulk substitute them. This will reduce the mobility of the oxygen ions, and therefore make them more stable, and hopefully give higher energy density. So I show you four pictures here. The original TIS2, you can see how big those single crystals were. Beneath that is lithium cobalt oxide. This is from Sony. Sony tried to make the lithium cobalt oxide as big as they could because they wanted to make those batteries safe. But as we moved on from the 1990s to the 2000 and 2010s, people wanted more and more power. So we went to these meatball morphologies, much more surface area, therefore more rapid reaction rate, discharge rate, but also reactivity with the environment. So in the last two or three years, there's been quite a lot of work spearheaded by Jeff Don in Canada and by my ex-student Jay Zhao in Pacific Northwest National Lab to go back to using single crystals. And I show you a picture of one there. So these single crystals have much less reactivity, which means they'll last much, much longer. And as Jeff likes to say, using the right nickel content, the right single crystal size, we can make these batteries last a million miles. I don't think any of us are gonna drive a million miles. But what this means is you can connect your electric vehicle to the grid at all times when you're not actually driving it. So the grid can take power from your battery or put power back into it. So that'll stabilize the electricity grid. And it should mean the electric utility is also paying you for using your battery so your electric vehicle will cost less. So what we're working on now in, in the Battery 500 project is what is the optimum size of making these single crystals and how might you make them, say, on the tonnage quantities rather than a few grams at a time. So Jay has determined that if you keep it below about three microns, they won't crack. And I'll show you the importance of cracking in a few minutes. So what about this um, first cycle loss? This is a typical cycling curve. So if you charge it from, say, three volts to begin with, up to about 4.4 volts, we tend not to go any higher because of reactivity with the electrolyte. Then you discharge back down again and I've shown you here a case where we've lost 30 milliamp hours per gram out of the 240 on that very first discharge, and you never get that back. So our goal was to understand why that's occurring and can we solve it. So what we did was measure the diffusion coefficient and the black circles there, lithium going into the lattice. And I think you can see the lithium diffusion coefficient drops by three orders of magnitude when you got more than, say, 70% lithium into the material. This is related to the diffusion mechanism, and if this was a normal classroom, it would have empty seats right in the middle of, of each row. So if an extra person wanted to come in, then everybody has to move. 
Similarly here in the lithium case, you, you need two empty seats for lithium to move, so all the lithiums have to move. So the fewer, fewer of these die vacancies, the slower the lithium diffusion coefficient. So that's what's slowing it down. To convince ourselves that that was indeed the case, first we charged to different voltages. We knew going higher and higher voltage would get better capacity, but we still, you still see this first cycle loss. And I should point out what we typically do is discharge 2.8 volts. If you hold it there, you got more lithium in, which is telling you straight away it's a kinetic issue. The other point to make here is when you get to 4.8 volts, you now see the charge, discharge curves are separated, which means our material is reacting with that electrolyte. So the system is falling apart. But we just now raise the temperature to 45 degrees from room temperature and you see the first cycle losses dropped considerably. And this red compares with this one. Now at um, 4.6 volts, we're seeing a separation, so we're getting reactivity at these higher temperatures. And it's even worse at um, 4.8 volts. So we said what we need to do is modify these materials um, so that this does not happen. And we had a clue in the sense that lithium cobalt oxide itself does not show this first cycle loss. And I'll show you some data on the right-hand side here. The black is at room temperature, and we held it for 100 hours at 2.8 volts. You can see all lithium eventually goes in, clearly kinetics. Um, at the red one is 45, it's almost all gone back in. Lithium cobalt oxide, there's no first cycle loss to speak of. So we said we're going to modify the material so this oxygen doesn't tend to go out and also hopefully so we can get the kinetics better. So we, we particularly chose niobium. And what we did is substitute niobium in the lattice and on the surface. And you control which one happens by just changing the temperature, say from 500 degrees it's surface coating, at 700 degrees it's fully inside. But even with the surface coating as shown here, it's more complicated because as the, some of the niobium goes into the lattice, some of the manganese comes out. So it turns out the surface coating is a mixture of lithium, niobium, manganese, and oxygen. But you can see, even if with just 1% lithium in here, sorry, 1% niobium in here, we've eliminated half that first cycle loss. So modifying the material using niobium does work. What we also wanted to do is and I should say this was surface coatings. Once we look at, um, if we put a niobium all the way in, what would do that to capacity retention? And the purple curve here is one with 2% niobium, and you can see over 200 cycles, we've essentially got no capacity loss. So we can now modify the structure, stop the oxygen diffusing, stop these rock salt type structures you find on the surface, but what was more important, what it did was stop the cracking of these meatballs. So on the left-hand side, this is 90% nickel. You see we get these large cracks with 90% um, nickel and 2% niobium. We get some finer cracks, no big ones. So having the big cracks in here, this allows the solvent and electrolyte to react with the material, form another film on top. So we clearly got a message that we can both reduce the first cycle loss and improve the capacity retention using niobium. But this is using standard electrolytes. We want to go to our new electrolyte. And this was one using um, our special electrolyte, which I say is an ether-based electrolyte using um, LIFSI as the salt. And you can see the coulombic efficiency is 100%. And the capacity here fades very little over these 300 cycles. And it turns out with this electrolyte, we're getting better capacity than with the earlier one. So we're, we're making progress. We believe we can get 1,000 cycles out of these um, systems. It's not clear niobium is the optimal material. But we've got a clue that we're on the right track. So let's look at the alternative. I mentioned lithium-ion phosphate is perfect for grid storage. 
It should be much lower cost. It has one major challenge. And if you have a Tesla car, read the inst instruct instruction manual there. Lithium ion phosphate is a flat discharge plateau, exactly 3.5 volts. With all these other materials, you've got a nice slopey discharge. So you know exactly how much lithium you've got in there, how much you've taken out. So you've got your regular, if you like, your gasoline gauge. With lithium ion phosphate, you don't know where you are. So the instruction manual says, when you get home, always plug it in. As I said, what we're interested in was really, let's go to the next stage and make these phosphates as high energy density as the oxides. So we looked at this vanadyl phosphate, vanadium is very good in the sense it goes from five plus to four plus to three plus. So it has a nice tunnel structure, so very stable. You can make this by what we call a hydrothermal technique, you just dissolve everything in the reactor, heat it to about 180 to 200 degrees centigrade for a day or two, and you get a beautiful structure out. It's full of protons now, but if we heat that, we can drive the protons out, or we can build a battery with it and actually pump the protons out. So if we do that, then we get these little cuboids, they're about 100 to 200 nanometers. And I'm going over this unfairly fast to the graduate students who did the work. It took them about two years to learn how to make these cuboids, they're electrochemically active. So it's not all that easy. But here's the discharge plateau. Just what you expect, vanadium five to vanadium four at about four volts, vanadium four to vanadium three at about two and a half volts. Our concern was, can you in fact put two lithium ions into a crystal lattice and not destroy that lattice? So if we look closely here, you'll see the black line is the first lithium insertion and removal, the purple one is the 50th, and the purple is in fact better than the first one. So at this point, I'm going to stop talking chemistry and talk about a few other things. I won't say the policy quite, but try to correct a few, um, I would call them errors out there, mishypes, whatever you want to call it. So questions always come up, are solid state batteries inherently safer than liquid batteries? Because the concern with our organic liquid batteries is the organic solvents burn. So for some years now, blue, shoot, blue solutions and Beloy cars, Beloy have been making cars with a polyethylene oxide, solid electrolyte, lithium metal, and now lithium ion phosphate as the cathode. And they've been running around Paris for more than a decade in Indianapolis, and they work fine in that particular application. And Michel Armand is famous for saying, typical for Parisians to burn cars when they're unhappy with the politicians. But when they do, the battery's still okay at the end of it. So he was saying, no, the batteries are good, but it's not clear they're good when they make much larger ones. So this is a case from October last year. One of these Mercedes buses was being charged overnight in the, the bus depot in Stuttgart, Germany. They think it caught fire whilst being charged. They're not sure yet. But, um, and there's some rumblings we're hearing that the lithium might actually have melted, which means it got 180 degrees centigrade in there. But what it did was destroy the garage and 25 other buses. So clearly, no, the government in Stuttgart weren't too happy about it. So that was in 2021. This spring in Paris, Buses now built by Beloy themselves with their batteries. Two of these caught fire whilst in service in Paris. No one got hurt, but they withdrew them from service last April. So there is an issue about whether large solid state batteries are safe, and that, so the judgment on that is still out there. So, make a few other points. People always ask me. Is lithium intercalation and lithium batteries going to be the future forever? For the next five to 10 years, I'd say yes. And it's for all the younger folks up here in the balconies and the audience. 
you've got to prove me wrong and come up with something much better and it's got to be obviously lower cost. But the key thing we have to do is come up with new manufacturing techniques. The manufacturing techniques have not changed since 1990. Um, we need to basically leapfrog that technology which the Asians really developed and turned into a huge success. But we've also got to look at where all the green challenges are in the whole supply chain. So we need to start looking at clean mining with clean energy. And this is what Europe is planning to do by doing the mining in Scandinavia using hydro energy to do all the processing. But we then got to look at actually using electro reduction, using that clean energy to do the reduction of the ores to the metal. We also need clean recycling technologies. Right now, my betting is more than half of you have a dead or semi-dead battery, phone, computer somewhere in your house not being used. Those all need to be recycled. There's a lot of valuable cobalt in there that can get fed back into the manufacturing scheme. And we need, as an alternative, clean hydrogen production. And I should have modified that as an interest now and also ammonia production. Ammonia may be easier to handle than hydrogen. But the key point I made earlier, COVID has taught us we can't rely on global supply chains. There's too many issues. We've all seen it between Russia and Germany. We saw it with um, COVID masks. We've seen it with semiconductors. So we need to start developing regional supply chains where most of the supply comes from within that region. And what we need to be able to say that no, our batteries are made in, in America or made in Europe and we don't ship them all around the world. Some of the minerals that go in the batteries, it's been calculated, they go 50,000 miles between when they get mined and when the finished battery is made. And we all clearly need an ecosystem for clean energy. So going back to this global supply chain, it's too constrained today. It, it raises security issues. It clearly raises major sustainability issues. In the batteries themselves, we as scientists or engineers, we have to find replacements for those critical elements, for example, the cobalt in particular. Seeing the challenges there, the, a mine opened up in Idaho in the United States maybe six to eight weeks ago, but that all then has to be shipped to either Brazil or Finland to be processed. There's nowhere in North America that can do it. That is crazy, and I hope it's not that bad over here. And things like graphite and the metals we need to source locally. I, I give the example of North America here. I think it could be equally well applied to Europe. North America and Europe have all the intellectual property on the chemistry in, in the batteries. Asia ha, has all know on the engineering of how to make them. And we have to start switching some of that around. So universities are basically leading the world in chemistry IP. There's a huge number of startup companies. This is something that the US has been very good at. There's a lot of investors willing to risk their money on startup companies. But be very wary when they read what they put in the newspapers, it's exponential hype. So unless they've got a third party to actually test their devices, don't necessarily um, believe it. But there are huge gaps between your inventor at the beginning and then your ma manufacturing on the other hand. We have to fill that gap and right now, Asia is filling that gap. So we are trying to make some changes there. And this shows the scenario Maybe I should have said yesterday here, but as I said, the chemistry, we all do, we've, we're on top of it. In the US, in New York State, we've got test facilities, we've got small pilot facilities, but if a company comes along and says, I want to make a thousand cells so a manufacturer can test them and see if it's any good, we can't do that. So they get sent to Asia, the technology goes to Asia, and then we buy back the finished batteries. So what we 
had planned to do is build a facility adjacent to our university. Um, many of you may not know, about four miles from the university was the original home of IBM. IBM left the region maybe 10, 15 years ago and they had about 10,000 people working there. So we've got huge facilities that are empty and ripe for being used. So we, we plan to build a facility there which will develop new manufacturing technologies as well as allow companies to make a batches of cells. And what we're trying to convince equipment manufacturers to, is to look at making equipment now for batteries. There's a couple of companies in Italy who do it. There's one or two in Germany. And there's one or two that do various parts in the US, but no one in the US can make the whole thing. As far as I know, no one in Europe can make the whole battery effort. So in the end, what we'll be able to do is manufacture those batteries in the US and supply our own systems. So what we did, we put in a very large proposal. Um, I expect Europe did the same thing. Our economic development agency in Washington had a Build Back America, America Regional Challenge competition. They had about um, 500 proposals. They cut that down to 60, and then they finally funded um, 21 of those. So between the federal government and the state government, we now have $113 million to build this facility. And it's not just the facility itself. It would be the facility is probably half this money. We've got to look at where these materials come from. So we had to build up a supply chain effort. But the biggest challenge whenever we talk to companies, and I'm sure it's identical here, is where are the workers going to come from? We don't know. We don't have workers who know how to make batteries. We don't have enough workers who do um, power electronics so we can connect the batteries to other devices. So what we're doing is putting many millions of dollars in trying to train workers from the high school level up to the PhD level. Um, we have startup companies under this acceleration task here because really the new ideas come from small startup companies than the larger companies may. Um, take them over. This effort here is called Justice and Equity. We're basing this in Endicott, New, New York, where IBM used to be, because it's a very depressed area. All those workers that used to work for IBM have either retired or they're out of work, so one of our jobs is to retrain and use those workers. So the actual facility itself, I think I've talked about most of this. It's going to encourage American equipment manufacturers. We're going to leapfrog the Asians, and particularly we want to make the batteries using clean methods. Um, batteries are now made by putting a paste on an electrode, baking that paste. That paste is using NMP, which is a nasty organic material. Um, I understand the European community is about to ban it. So it's only a matter of time before the battery folks will have to come up with something new. And we'll make it industrial size batteries, but at about a 30 megawatt hour size and all different configurations. So we were told at the end of September, we had won this award, and by the way, it started September the 4th. That's the way US government does the fiscal year ends at the end of September. So you're supposed to start spending before that. Um, and this effort kicked off about three weeks ago. And on the left-hand side is this is the Secretary of the Economic Development Agency. We're showing her around a small gigafactory we have already started up in those IBM facilities. And on the right is the head of the US Senate, that's Senator Schumer, who came to Binghamton for the same activity. So right now with Schumer in charge in Washington of the Senate and Democrats, there's going to be a huge effort to keep this climate change effort going in the United States. But I just want to conclude by um, saying energy storage isn't just one area where we have um, excess globalization. We've seen it in semiconductors. We've seen it in COVID masks. We have to make sure 
Everything is more sustainable. We can't keep wasting and throwing everything away all the time. So all the materials we use have to be recycled. And I would emphasize they have to be recycled regionally. We as developed nations, we can't um, send all our junk to third world countries. If we make something, we have to be responsible for recycling it. And this covers plastics was a huge issue throughout the world. Clothing is probably another huge, huge issue throughout the world and electronics. So what I'm saying, we need to ask climate change, but climate change includes everything that's sustainable. And I will stop there, and if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Szanowni Państwo, jeśli ktoś będzie chciał zadać pytanie, zapraszam tutaj do mikrofonu. Proszę się nie bać. Tak, zachęcamy do zadawania pytań. Trzeba podejść do mikrofonu po to, żeby wszyscy mogli usłyszeć zarówno pytanie, jak i odpowiedź. No niemożliwe, proszę Państwa, to jest Politechnika Warszawska. Zawsze o coś, o coś się musicie spytać. I have a question. I'm, I'm really interested in how you managed to make your PhD in one year after getting a master's degree. <laughs> you have to understand the Oxford system. Okay. So I had a Bachelor of Arts. There was no such thing as a Bachelor of Science when I was there. Okay. So the Master of Arts degree you get after, I think it's seven years of paying fees. Okay. No work, no <laughs> thesis. It just says you're now a senior member of the university. You can vote for the chancellor and you can vote for the poet laureate or something else like that. Thank you. Proszę Państwa, zapraszam. Thank you very much for your lecture. I re I'm really honored uh, I could attend it. Uh, and I have a question since you are the father of uh, lithium ion batteries, and I think uh, we could say, oh, uh, we all could say that. Uh, what are your perspective on post lithium uh, technologies? And uh, since you said, like, Lithium batteries could be the uh, state of the art for five to ten years, and after that, uh, what do you think? Like the sodium batteries, magnesium. What do you think will be the technology of the future? I think if we can solve some of the problems, lithium sulfur may be the next one because it can have a much higher energy density. Um, magnesium, no chance at all. If you're working on magnesium batteries, stop wasting your time. <laughs> Because magnesium voltage is about one volt less than lithium. No one has shown they can get more than one electron out of magnesium. So its energy density is very, very low. If you can make calcium work, calcium will have the same voltage as lithium. It will also, because it's larger, maybe diffuse faster in the lattice. So there's one or two groups around the world looking at calcium. I would say calcium is a much better bet than magnesium. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, again, I think you proved that materials are the most important. They decide about the development of civilization. We had Stone Age, um, Copper Age, Bronze Age. Iron and so on. Now we have probably silicon age, and these functional materials for energy storage are also very important. Uh, but there are some materials developed by um, human beings, like in the 60s, plastics. You touched this issue, recycling and uh, pollution. So there are some patches, two patches big on uh, oceans, floating and so on. So, what is your um, opinion about this recycling and the problem of? over uh, application of plastics because these are very, very bad materials, in my opinion, contrary to met metals, which can be recycled right. forever. So I totally agree with you. The, I expect the only solution 
is to talk to the politicians and make it required to recycle all the plastics. And I don't mean by recycling it, you put it in your garbage can, then the garbage collector picks it up, then ships it off to Thailand or somewhere. No. The worst case, the least worst case scenario is if necessary, you take all the plastics and you use them, you burn them to make some energy out of it. But a lot of them should be recyclable, then, no. All the polyethylenes, polypropylenes, no, they're thermal plastics. You should better recover those and put them back into the system. There's just got to be the dictate that the chemical and oil companies do that. As they make the plastics, they have to take them back. My question is, what, when it comes to the disposal of these new materials, because uh, of course, they have like a bigger capacity and better just parameters. But what, in, what will happen to them once they finish their work as our lithium-ion batteries? They, they should be get totally recycled. Lead-acid batteries are, you know, 99% of them are recycled today because the government says they will be. The lithium-ion batteries, certainly the large ones, they'll go to recycling plants. We've got to start collecting all the small ones. In the United States, there's a, one company called Lithium Cycle. It's based in Rochester, New York. It's a Toronto company. But they claim they're making money already on recycling old batteries. So you believe we'll be able to like, um, recycle the entirety of, like, for example, the uh, lithium sulfide and reuse it in future batteries? Yes, certainly the issue comes at the point where if you're saying using lithium ion phosphate, the iron's worth nothing, the phosphorus and oxygen aren't worth. So there may have to be a subsidy or a charge for recycling those. But the government has said they, they will be recycled and even the, the copper current collectors are worth quite a lot of money in the batteries. So the government in the US will take care of like the also the profit factor and the like for the companies when it comes to the recycling of the batteries? You have to be very careful because in the United States we have 50 states and the separation of powers between the states and the federal government. So I expect what's going to happen there is the states will have to do it and I expect states like New York and California will put regulations in place very soon. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to uh, hear your lecture. Can, uh, could you tell us some details about progress in uh, lithium recy recycling? Uh, yeah, as I said, there's, there's recycling go all the way from the brute force and ignorance technique where you get the batteries and you just crush them and burn them. Then you've got what they call a black mass, mm -hmm. which has got some of the lithium but not much of it. You've got nickel, cobalt, manganese, copper. Then you separate those to go into new batteries. Um, some of the other extreme are companies who are trying to take the materials off the electrode, recondition them so they can use them again. But it's important to remember, most of the initial recycling will be done on extremely good material. There's about a 10% wastage in every gigafactory. So those materials will go straight back in, into a recycling. They will take the material off the electrode and that will go straight back into the manufacturing facility. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk, and it's a great pleasure to have you here at Faculty of Physics. I would like to ask, on the one of the slides you showed uh, the big leap steps, uh, the big steps in, in battery chemistry. Do you think that any, any further step, any, any one big change in the battery chemistry is possible? For example, I don't know, uh, stopping using the transitional metals or some maybe organic cathodes or electrolytes, uh, anodes, sorry. Yes. So you're talking about big changes in the yeah. chemistry? Yeah, exactly. Some other giant steps. Yeah. It may be tough, but you're, you younger folks don't have the blinders on like us have been working in the field for decades. There's really been only three or four cathode materials in. 50 years, the layered sulfides and the layered oxides, and then the phosphate class of materials. 
And on the anode, it's really was lithium metal and lithium aluminum and now graphite. So we need somebody to come up with a totally new material. And when you look at the periodic table, there's only about six or eight elements you can actually use that are there in large enough quantities. No in the earth to use. But no. If I knew the answer, I'd have patented it. Right? <laughs> I made a lot and lots of money. So it's up to you younger folks. Come up with something totally new. As I said, John Goodenough tried lithium cobalt oxide. No one would have told him that it was going to work, but he tried it, so tried to come up with something new. You know, people have looked at fluorides, but there's obviously issues with now fluorides getting into the atmosphere. But I think there are opportunities there. There's been very few inventions in the last 50 years. There's got to be something else. Uh, usually the people who don't know the restrictions make the biggest progress. Yes, so exactly. Thank you very much. Yes, hello, thank you. Now, regarding the fact that the talk is about energy storage, I was going to talk about, I was going to ask about, I'm sorry, not talk about, ask about uh, energy manufacturing and what are your opinions on what the future might be? I don't know, maybe uh, nuclear or fusion plants? Because obviously, I mean, uh, not so obviously, we can't really fulfill the entire world's needs on solar and, and uh, wind so far. Um, solar, wind, with um, hydropower can do a lot of it. I think France has shown that nuclear power can do most of it. So I think nuclear will be there for the long term. And hopefully those nuclear power plants may be of a different type. They'll be much smaller, so they can be regional and not cost nearly as much. But I think nuclear is going to be there as a base load for a long, long time and maybe increasing. Yes, thank you. Hello, sir. Uh, my name is Christian, and thank you for being here. Um, I got a question. How did your childhood contributed, contribute to your achievements now? <laughs> <laughs> let, let me say, uh, my parents let me do whatever I wanted to do. They didn't discourage me from doing anything. And I had a great physics teacher and a great chemistry teacher at school, and they really got me excited about doing chemistry and physics. But I think it's much more difficult today because you're not allowed to do those chemistry experiments we used to do in those days because they're declared as being too dangerous. No, you can't do that. You can't um, burn up the place. And I still remember in the organic chemistry lab at Oxford, we became experts at using fire extinguishers because some of the people would throw their ethos down the sink and they'd be smoking at the same time and stub the cigarette out in the sink and up it went. Um, and in the physics and engineering area, I see far fewer students have any hand skill, no, capabilities anymore. They all do everything on the computer. They don't know how to make things, how to fix things. So I think that that's something we need to correct. Okay, thank you. Hello, thank you very much for this amazing lecture. And I have a question. Uh, how did you like, start started, uh, to get on this topic that was uh, very new in, uh, like back in the times on uh, working on lithium batteries, which was we, uh, you haven't got like, uh, electric devices like we have. And how did you cope with this uh, so new topic and get into this work and uh, hope that something uh, will get out of it? Yes. So my research was at Oxford and then the beginning work at Stanford was all tied into how, how fast ions can move in solids. And Ford Motor Company had made a big announcement that in sodium beta alumina, those sodium ions could move as fast as in that solid as in liquids. And they were going to build a battery using that ceramic material. To make some measurements on those materials, we then used the same materials I worked on at Oxford what we call tungsten bronzes, so the ions go fast in and out. And if you've flown on the 787, that's what's in the, those windows in the 787 where you push a button and they darken, which is really an electrochemical reaction. So I got interested in um, how ions move fast, and then we did some chemical reactions for superconductors at Exxon. We found a lot of heat was generated, so we said, 
we can make batteries out of these materials and it's all tied again into how fast ions can move in solids. People hadn't really conceived that we could insert ions into solids. So if you go back and look at any battery literature in say the 1960s, they don't talk about ions going into solids, they talk about ions abstracting oxygen from solids. So your typical reaction say in your dry cell, that zinc manganese oxide cell, they'll show that as zinc producing hydrogen, the hydrogen then reduces the manganese oxide to MN2O3 plus water. Now, if, as a solid state chemist and somebody looked at ionic conductivity, we said that can't happen. So we've, we showed straight away that, in fact, protons are inserted into the manganese oxide to make manganese oxyhydroxide. So it was really all tied in with um, fast ion transport and a number of us got involved in this whole community now called solid state ionics. And we had the meeting here 11 years ago. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, uh, I also would like to thank for your excellent talk. And my question, I have a very two, short two questions. One, one is, uh, now we have uh, as if two uh, directions in, in energy producing, let's say, especially in transportation, batteries and fuel cells. Uh, what is your opinion on, on what uh, option will win or they will be somehow uh, complementary? That is one question. And the other, um, did Exxon stop uh, the battery research programs after you left or, or keeps it going? Mm -hmm. so, so let's do the fuel cell battery one. Fuel cells are primary batteries. Yeah. So you put the fuel in at one side, oxygen, the other side you make water or whatever you're going to make. They, they operate most efficiently at constant output. So you put them in the car, you can't accelerate or, and you can't um, do regenerative braking. So in all the vehicles that have a fuel cell in them, and there are a few buses in the United States and there's some in Europe, I think, you also, also have a very large battery. The fuel cell is used to keep the battery charged. But I don't I, I know that works in buses. For large trucks in the United States, they're looking at a similar idea fuel cells full of hydrogen and you'll recharge the fuel cell every say 500 miles on interstate highways. It makes no sense though putting fuel cells into cars that you and I drive. If you work out the efficiencies of making the hydrogen from electricity, then the efficiency of the fuel cell is much worse than putting the um, electricity into batteries and then using the batteries. So I think most people have, have stopped um, working on fuel cells. I know Toyota had a big push, but that seems to have died away. Okay. And the, the second question, Exxon. Oh, what happens in large corporations? Upper management changes every so often. So Exxon was um, very big in batteries, they were big in fuel cells with Alstom in France. They were the largest manufacturer of solar photovoltaic cells in the US, and they did the nuclear reprocessing for the US government. But there came a time when top management asked us, you're telling us the market isn't $100 million a year now? Why are we investing in this? And in a sense, we we're really too early because what happened at the beginning of the 70s, after we started this research, we had this Saudi boycott, so the oil prices went way high, then they came way down again. So they couldn't, in their minds, see a scenario where they could make money on either fuel cells or um, batteries. So they got out of this whole area of what was in a company called Exxon Enterprises. That include word processors, some chips, and various other things. So they just got out of the whole business and license the technology to the Japanese. Okay, thank you very much. In material engineering, there is now at the moment a lot of interest in so-called um, materials that are stabilized by entropy, high end entropy materials. Uh, don't you think that a new class of uh, electrodes 
could also be of this kind of materials that are mixtures of many many ingredients and uh, usually machine learning is used for to design to, for a proper design of such materials what is all your opinion of this direction let's say at the moment it's an interesting academic exercise the people working on these materials but the the challenge is the voltage on the cell goes all the way up from four and a half volts down to one and a half volts so how much of that is useful energy is not clear and the rates of those materials tend to be very low and the ones i've seen they're extremely reactive with the atmosphere so with moisture co2 so there's lots of challenges there um people are using machine learning to optimize batteries um, theory has not yet come up with a new battery material. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of my colleagues have said we can do it, but it's been more challenging than they thought it would be. Thank you. Thank you for the lecture. I'd like to ask about uh, what do you think of other ways to uh, save energy in the industrial, for example, potential energy vaults or uh, flying wheels? energy volts. So in the case of flywheels, there was a facility in Albany, New York. It was um, very successfully, very successfully, technically, it was a disaster economically. Because flywheels basically have to be built into concrete bunkers, so they're very expensive. The company went bankrupt. So that another company bought the facility because they didn't have any capital investment, they're now making a lot of money. It's not clear that flywheels are any good for energy storage, they're good for energy smoothing. So if you want to make sure you keep the frequency the same, that's where flywheels may be more useful. For potential energy, that's what a pumped hydro really is. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you for your lecture. So I have two questions uh, due, due to some topics that you mentioned. First, you mentioned that ammonia will be the future of, of energy storage. Why do you believe ammonia, like not hydrogen, um, would, would, would be our future in, in this case? And second question is due to, due to your call, like to make everything as regional as possible. So. To make it as regional as possible, like keep it in single household. Like, what do you believe will be the uh, the way to storage energy in, in a single household? Will it be like hydrogen cell, or will it be like lithium, lead, something something else that we would keep safely in in our households? So the issue with hydrogen is very difficult to transport, either in a truck. If you're going to put it in a fuel cell, you need high pressure. So you have to pressurize the hydrogen once you get it to the recharging facility. And you can't pass pure hydrogen easily through pipelines because they will then brittle them. They, they mixed it with um, natural gas to increase it to some extent. Um, and if you look at the storage of hydrogen, it's about 5%. So we get a tank to store the hydrogen. Hydrogen is only 5% of the weight of that tank. The present feeling is ammonia is much easier to handle. It's a li liquid if you put it under pressure. And you can store it, move it around. And only time will tell which one wins out. But there's a fairly big push to move to ammonia. If you're using hydrogen, the feeling is you will make the hydrogen at the spot where you're actually going to use it. So in America, you, you put it on the interstate or in Germany on the autobahn. You, you'd have the solar panels generating electricity, which then generate hydrogen from water. Then it goes straight into your vehicles at that point. Okay. okay. What about the second part, like about the storage in, in our households? How, what do what you believe will be the safe and efficient way to, to storage energy, like from from voltaic cells that, that we can, well, that we may have yeah. in our household. You can already buy these battery banks that can go in the wall of your garage and other places. Whether that's the most economically reasonable is not clear to me. You know, better is probably talk about micro and nano grids, where you may have, say, 100 houses. 
sharing a storage facility, or if you're in a, in a complex of flats or apartments, that building would have a, a storage facility, and it would be outside the building for safety reasons. So there's always concerns if you put large storage facilities within the building itself, and in particular in New York City, there's such strict rules now by the fire department that's very few going actually inside the building. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's, it's time to continue the discussion in the coffee break. I mean, out there on the, on the banks, you can, we, you can have a coffee, tea or, or some juices. So, so please stay with us, uh, discuss with uh, Professor Whittingham or with, uh, with other experts from, from our university. Uh, maybe my last comment would be, uh, Professor Whittingham mentioned about many challenges. There are so many young people and, and actually those challenges were addressed to you. So probably the, the answer should be challenge accepted. And this is kind of my conclusion and let's thank once more for Professor Whittingham. Szanowni Państwo, ale jest jeszcze jeden element dzisiejszego dnia. Tak, poprosimy Pana Profesora Marka Marcinka o, o, o krótkie wprowadzenie do tego elementu. Yeah, just a short introduction. So you just mentioned, Professor, that we need some action in Europe, in the United States. And I just want to mention that the Warsaw University of Technology is also participating in the very big project called Battery 2030 Plus. Actually, it's supervised by the member of Nobel Prize Committee, Professor Christina Ekstrom. Uh, we just exchanged some emails with Christina today, and she's sending you a big hug. So I'm giving the big virtual hug to you, Professor. And as a result of this. Uh, project, uh, young students from four different universities, from Brussels, Uppsala, uh, Torino, uh, and yes, so four, uh, they create the Young Manifesto uh, for the creation of the batteries of the future, what they are expecting for the bat from the batteries and how this business will look like in the future. And this is the manifesto, this is the task for us, for professors, but also for you students. And could you imagine you are studying in such a university when we doing in physics and chemistry, such a great science which is related to the Nobel Prize winners and the members of the Nobel Prize Committee. So big applause for you colleagues, for you professors, and especially for our guests. And thank you, Professor, for accepting this young manifesto from our students. Proszę Państwa, i to już jest koniec. Bardzo dziękujemy Państwu. Jeszcze raz gorące brawa dla naszego gościa i dla nas wszystkich, dla Państwa. Dziękujemy.